Welcome to the audio commentary for Shigeo Tanaka's Gamera vs. Berugan. I'm August Rigoni, author of Eiji Tsuburaya, Master of Monsters, and joining me is our project translator and unapologetic Gamera fan, Jason Varney. Hello, everyone. Because of the success of Gamera, Daae pushed a big-budgeted sequel into production, which was released only six months later on April 17, 1966, during the year of the monster boom in Japan. Baragon's support feature was Kimiyoshi Yasuda's memorable Dai Majin, a period fantasy about a stone idol that comes to life seeking to punish the wicked. This opening title back sequence with the swirling paint seems reminiscent of Roger Corman's mesmerizing opening sequence for his 1961 film, The Pit and the Pendulum, starring Vincent Price. But perhaps the inspiration was closer to home and was prompted by the opening title card for Subaraya Productions' hit fantasy television series, Ultra Q, the precursor to Ultraman, which premiered four months before this film was released. The opening scene with this flashback of the first film was not in Nissan Takahashi's original screenplay, which had no allusions to the first film and was added solely to bring those audience members who did not have the benefit of seeing the first film up to speed. The screenplay opens with the main character, Keisuke Hirata, flying a Cessna over Osaka with his flight instructor, Kishimoto. Suddenly, massive radio interference causes Keisuke to lose temporary control of the aircraft, a reference to Gamera's ability to jam radio waves. Once they regain control, they wonder what the source of the jamming interference was. Then, Takahashi takes us into space where the Z-Plan rocket, containing a trapped Gamera, is on a collision course with the meteorite. There is panic at mission control as they try to change the flight path of the Martian-bound spacecraft. Instead of colliding, as in the film, they narrowly avoid the celestial body, but this alters the spacecraft's trajectory and it falls back to Earth. Re-entering the atmosphere, the Z-Plan capsule begins to glow red-hot until it finally explodes, releasing Gamera. The monster proceeds to Kurobe Dam, which does take place in the film, as you see here. In the screenplay, we wipe from the destruction of Kurobe Dam to Keisuke and Kishimoto still aloft, apprised of Gamera's return to Earth by the control tower. They wonder where the monster is heading to. The only information being offered to them is due east. Keisuke concludes the discussion by saying he doesn't want to know where Gamera goes, but hopes that he never returns to Japan. Well, so much for hope. The scene continues with Keisuke telling Kishimoto that this is his last day and is quitting now for Japan's progress tomorrow. This part of the scene was revised in the finished film and the introduction of Keisuke's character, which we'll see in a couple of minutes. Even though he helmed a hit with the first Gamera, director Noriaki Iwasa was demoted on this production and was given the job of visual effects director, while veteran Shigeo Tanaka was put in place as the main director. Still, Iwasa's supervision of the visual effects in this film is a step up from the previous entry and features some of the best stage miniature sequences of all the Gamera films. The big budget given this production is absolutely apparent especially when watching this amazing new transfer. Standing 610 feet high, Kurobe Dam, located in Toyama Prefecture, is Japan's largest dam, completed in 1963. The monumental work on this dam, which cost the lives of 200 workers, was brought to the screen in K. Kumai's A Tunnel in the Sun, a lavish 1968 production starring Toshiro Mifune. Based on the novel, The Sun in Kurobe, by Shoji Kimoto, the film was followed by two television dramatizations in 1969 and 2009, respectively. Japanese filmmakers seem drawn to having their monsters destroy dams, and these sequences, in films as varied in quality from Ishiro Honda's Mothra in 1961 to Jun Fukuda's Godzilla vs. Megalon in 1973, are usually some of the most impressive sequences in these films. The destruction here is also equally spectacular. So spectacular, actually, that they reuse the sequence in Gamera vs. Virus. In the original screenplay, the scenes of Gamera destroying Kurobe Dam wipes to the scene of Hirata and Kishimoto on the plane. Here, the film has Gamera, after destroying Kurobe Dam, and insatiable for more raw energy, flying off to a fictional Mount Uzal located on the equator according to the narration. Did Takahashi pick Uzal out of the Bible? Or is it Japanese rendering of another biblical name, Azal or Aizal? 
or the Spanish word azul. Since Gamma is heading below the equator, one would assume the latter. Here we are introduced to the main character, Keisuke Hirata, played by Kojiro Hongo, one of Dai's biggest leading men of the 1960s. We'll come back to talk about Hongo and his career a little later on. Longtime Dai contract player Gen Hirata played his flight instructor, Kishimoto, who had notable parts in Shigeo Tanaka's Firefighting Suicide Squadron, 1951, and Shigeyoshi Suzuki's Cave of the Blue Dragon, 1956. He also appears as a sailor in Kojishima's Warning from Space, 1956, and as a field engineer in Gamma vs. Gauss, 1967. Not in the original screenplay, this is an establishing scene of the home of Ichiro Hirata, Keisuke's older brother. Hirata runs a professional photography studio, while his wife, Sedae, who you'll see as the older woman in the dark kimono, is a koto instructor. First introduced from China during the Nara period, 710 to 784, the koto is the national musical instrument of Japan. This scene seems to have been added to serve a dual purpose. It establishes Hirata as affluent and added exoticism for foreign audiences. Fused grenades cannot be a good omen. In Hirata's dark room, as in the original screenplay, we meet the cast of characters who set the narrative in motion. Ichiro Hirata, center, played by Akira Natsuki, Onodera, Wright, played by Koji Fujiyama, and Kawajiri, played by Yuzo Hayakawa. By their wardrobe, the character's social statuses are communicated to the audience. Hirata is dressed as an independent but well-to-do businessman, while the working-class Kawajiri wears a merchant marine officer's uniform. Keisuke here is smartly outfitted as befitting his youth. Diametrically opposed to them, sporting dark glasses, Onodera is gaudily dressed as a ne'er-do-well, indicating his shady background and foreshadowing the most villainous character of the human drama. Akira Natsuki, sometimes billed as Sho Natsuki, was a familiar face in over 50 films he made during his 15 years at Daiei Studios, generally cast as authority figures, policemen, detectives, scientists, soldiers, doctors, and so on. A favorite of directors Kani Ichikawa and Yasuzo Masamura, Natsuki was cast in Ichikawa's The Pit, 1957, Masamura's Giants and Toys, 1958, Ichikawa's Fires on the Plain, 1959, Masamura's Black Test Car, 1962, and Ichikawa's The Money Dance, 1963, among others. During his tenure at Daiei, Natsuki also appeared in several entries in the Woman Gambler movie series, featuring Baragon co-star Kyoko Inami, as well as a handful of fantasy films. In Warning from Space, 1956, and Yuasa's Gamma vs. Virus, 1967, he plays aliens. And in Mitsuo Murayama's Invisible Man Meets the Flyman, 1957, he plays a forensic graphologist. Natsuki did a whole lot of Gamera and is featured as a self-defense forces commander in Gamera vs. Gauss, 1967, as a reporter in Gamera vs. Gilan, 1969, as Dr. Suzuki in Gamera vs. Jiger, 1970, and as Dr. Sawamoto in Gamera vs. Zigra, 1971. A number of supporting players in the first two Gamera films served as a sort of acting stable for Yuasa and were cast throughout the subsequent entries in the series, including Fujiyama and Hongo, much to his chagrin at the time. If you'll notice, between Keisuke and Hirata, you'll see the latter's crutch, which Keisuke leaned against the sink. This is connected to a jump cut that may cause some viewers to think that something's missing. There is. When Onodera steps around behind Hirata, he knocks the crutch, causing it to slide down against the wall and then falls to the ground. So film editor Tatsuji Nakashizu was forced to cut out the crutch hitting the floor. It's unknown as to why director Shigeo Tanaka chose not to reshoot this scene, unless he felt that the audio could be fixed in post-production. Perhaps the actors were unavailable to loop their dialogue, which made it necessary to edit the scene in this manner. Again, fused grenades are not a good idea. <laughs> Now, who would have ever imagined that the director of photography on this giant monster movie, Michio Takahashi, would be the very same cinematographer who shot Alain René's internationally lauded 1959 film, Hiroshima Monomura. 
Aren't these all supposed to be cheap jack affairs made by talentless hacks? Well, if the resumes of those involved in making these films are any indication, it only bears the staggering ignorance of Western critics and their prejudice against them. Another slight jump cut here seems as though there was another last-minute deletion. What was cut was not indicated in the screenplay. Michio Takahashi began his career in the 1930s and was the director of cinematography at Shochiku Kamata and Ofuna Studios. He joined IA in 1942, where he remained for the duration of his career. Some of his extensive credits include Kazuo Mori's 300 Miles Through Enemy Lines, 1957, and Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall, 1962. After shooting 120 films, Takahashi shot only one more after this. Tanaka's Young Boss, The Wild Rook, 1966, featuring superstar Raizo Ichikawa. In the original screenplay, the female dancers are described as being topless, a concession that this film was originally aimed at an older demographic. This was changed so the film could be enjoyed by audiences of all ages. The dancing team here is the Takashi Masada dance troupe. To fans of Japanese cinema, the two lead dancers may seem familiar. Nanako Yamada and Tatsuo Sakai, both of whom were members of the famous Nichigeki dancing team, featured in Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress, 1958, and Nishiro Honda's Mothra, 1961. The multi-award winning Yamada studied under her father, Goro Yamada, the famous dancer and opera star, as well as Seiko Takada and Kentaro Sakurama. Devoted to modern dance, she continues to perform today and runs the Nanako Yamada Dance Studio in Tokyo. Now, Yuasa must have loved this impressive glass mat painting with a real helicopter landing out in an outdoor village set because it remains on screen for a full 45 seconds. It's really a pretty amazing mat painting. It's just beautiful. Tragically, this is now a lost art because of CGI. Yeah, a lot of mat painters are out of work. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's just wrong. Does it, anyone even know what a matte painting is anymore? Uh, yeah, the kids can Google it. <laughs> Some may scoff at Japanese actors made up to look like natives, but before pointing fingers, it was also a similar standard in Hollywood at the time, with Caucasians playing Native Americans. Rock Hudson in Winchester 73, 1950, Victor Mature in Chief Crazy Horse 1955, Audrey Hepburn in The Unforgiven 1960, and Martin Landau in Hallelujah Trail 1965. Back in the 1960s, Hollywood had no excuse, while Japanese filmmakers certainly couldn't have called and hired natives to be in the film. This is the village chief, played by veteran character actor Joe Ohara, who made over 60 films starting in the 1930s. He was cast in Kenji Mizuguchi's Gion Festival 1933, and The Straits of Love and Hate 1937, and Yasujiro Ozu's Floating Weeds 1959. We'll see him next as a hotel manager in Gamera vs. Gauss 1967. Here, Keisuke makes his first mistake discounting his joining the expedition by handing over the revolver to Onodera, foreshadowing a double crossing of both Kawajiri and Keisuke. Now we have the entrance of our leading lady, the striking Kyoko Inami, playing Karin, the chief's daughter. Her character becomes most important to the narrative later in the film, but we'll discuss more about Inami and her long career a little later on. Enter Dr. Matsushita, played by Ichiro Sugai, born July 25, 1907. Cast in over 300 films, Sugai joined Nikatsu's Kyoto Studios in 1925 and made his screen debut in Kenjiro Saigusa's Victory of the Poor that same year. He appeared in Tomu Uchida's Miss Nippon, 1931, Kenji Mizuguchi's The Water Magician, 1933, and Shigeo Tanaka's Three Flowers, 1935. Sugai, with several other notable actors, formed his own acting troupe in 1940 to go freelance. He began appearing in films for masters such as Masahiro Makino, Kajiro Yamamoto, and Yutaka Abe. Sugai was also cast in the films of a young director named Akira Kurosawa, starting with Sanjiro Sugata in 1943 as Police Chief Mishima and The Most Beautiful in 1944 as Ken Shinda. He was also cast in the films of other important directors, such as Mikio Naruse's The Descendants of Urashima Taro, 1946, Tadashi Imai's An Enemy of the People, also 1946, Yasujiro Ozu's Early Summer, 1951, Konichikawa's Mr. Poo, 1953, and Ishiro Honda's Eagle of the Pacific, also 1953. He directed two films of his own at Nikatsu Studios, Muddy Youth, 1953, and Frankie the Spaceman, 1957, starring actor-comedian Frankie Sakai. Sugai also appeared in numerous television shows in regular and guest-starring roles, and TV movies, such as Ever Onward, 1957, Akaroshi, 1964, Three Sisters, 1967, Onward, Ryoma, 1968, The Playgirls, 1969, Dauntless Are Men, 1970, 
The Great Chushingura, 1971, Howl at the Sun, 1972, and The Bamboo Dolls of Echizen, 1973. Sugai also appeared in a semi-regular role as a private investigator in the live-action animated adaptation of Osama Tezuka's oddly titled werewolf saga, Vampire, 1968. The actor passed away on August 11th, 1973, at the age of 66. Playing the filthy Onodera is actor Koji Fujiyama, sometimes billed as Koichi Fujiyama, who began his career at Daiei Studios in the 1950s. Almost exclusively cast as heavies, he had major roles as Tadao Yokoyama in Yasuzo Masamura's Giants and Toys, 1958, Gokishi in Kenji Misumi's Zatoichi Challenge, 1967, Yamazaki in Shunya Ito's Female Prisoner Scorpion Beast Stable, 1973, Goro Kuroki in Sister Street Fighter Hanging by a Thread, 1974, and Mishima in Yukio Noda's Zero Woman, The Red Handcuffs, 1974. Here, Onodera is about to uh, threaten the natives with a six-shot revolver. Does he realize that there's only six bullets in the gun? No, I really don't think he does. And does he have any spares? <laughs> I don't know. Fujiyama made the transition to freelance before Daiei claimed bankruptcy in 1971 and was already appearing in Toei and Toho productions by the late 1960s. At Toei, he was cast mainly in modern Yakuza actioners, such as Kinji Fukasaku's Street Mobster, 1972, and Hideo Gosha's Violent Streets, 1974. At Toho, Fujiyama found himself appearing in several of the Lone Wolf and Cub films for actor-producer Shintaro Katsu. Fujiyama also played the evil Arai in Kenji Misumi's The Wrath of Daimajin, 1966, and appears in most of the Gameras. In the previous film, he was the oil refinery foreman. He next appears in Gamera vs. Virus, 1968. The score for this film was written and composed by Chuji Kinoshita, brother of director Keisuke Kinoshita. Born April 9, 1916, he moved to Tokyo in 1934, upon graduating from high school, to study voice and musical theory with composer Saburo Muroi. In 1940, he joined the New Symphony Orchestra, now the NHK Symphony Orchestra. Kinoshita was also composing music for news bulletins, but this was cut short when he was drafted into service. After the war, his brother helped him to obtain a position at Chochiku, and he soon composed his first film score in 1946 for his own siblings, The Girl I Loved. In fact, he composed most of his brother's films and even acted and sang in Broken Drum 1949, also directed by his brother. In 1951, he composed the score for Japan's first color film, Carmen Comes Home, 1951, and won an award for Masaki Kobayashi, Somewhere Under the Broad Sky, 1954. The theme song he composed for 1957's Times of Joy and Sorrow went on to become a big hit that year. His most notable film credits are probably the 1949 version of The Ghost of Yotsuya, starring Ken Uehara, as well as 24 Eyes 1954, both for his brother, and Masaki Kobayashi's multi-film epic, The Human Condition, starting in 1959. During his very prolific career, Kinoshita astonishingly scored over 400 feature films. He also scored the first feature from Toei Animation, Panda and the Magic Serpent, 1959, and the 1973 live-action adaptation of Gogo 13, starring Ken Takakura. From the 60s through the 80s, while also scoring films, he also composed for a number of television series, such as Mito Komon, 1969, and the animated Camelero, 1974, based on the Italian comic script, which became big hits. His last screen credit is the 1988 feature Father, which, surprise, was directed by his brother, Keisuke Kinoshita. In the original screenplay, scene 15, Trekking Through the Jungle, does not include the earlier quicksand scene, and their journey from the village to the cave is much shorter. While much of the production design, lighting, and photography on this picture is excellent, perhaps some of the cave interiors may seem overlit for modern viewers. But for the time the film was produced, this was pretty much the way such studio sets were lit and shot. And I think it's pretty effective. Yeah, in fact, a lot of films during this period, some of them were, were really overlit and sure. kind of looked bad. So for the time, this is kind of effective and atmospheric. The lighting director was Tsunikichi Shibata, a veteran of over 80 films going back to the late 1940s, including Akira Kurosawa's The Quiet Duel, 1949, Kon Ichikawa's Nihonbashi, 1956, and Yasuzo Masamura's Black Test Car, 1962. Now in this scene, they're going to be attacked by bats. And when the bats swoop in, the Foley sound effects for the flying rodents were originally intended for the titular creatures in Daiei's aborted giant rat movie, Nezura. 
The details of this ill-fated monster movie production are covered in the previous audio commentary, so you need to go buy that. Planning and creating the sets was production designer Tokuji Shibata, who began his career as a set decorator in the late 1930s. Joining Dae in the mid-1940s, he was the art director of choice for master filmmaker Tianosuke Kinugasa, who directed the Academy Award-winning Gate of Hell. Shibata worked on over 80 films at Dae, including Kani Chikawa's Fires on the Plane, 1959, and Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall, 1962. Onodera opines that the sting of the scorpion he has killed is strong enough to kill a hippo. But is there such a deadly scorpion? The most venomous in the world are the fat tail and the emperor, while there are also seven subspecies of scorpion in New Guinea. The deadliest of them all can kill a man in five to seven minutes without the proper antitoxin. Playing Kawajiri is Yuzo Haikawa, born as Mitsuyuki Kurauchi on January 25, 1925 in the port city of Kobe. As Yuji Hayakawa, he was accepted in Dae's New Faces talent search in 1949 and made his screen debut in Seiji Hisanasa's Mother Lighthouse, 1949. In 1955, he changed his stage name to Yuzo Hayakawa. He appeared in over 70 films, including Koji Shima's Warning from Space, 1956, Kani Chikawa's Fires on the Plain, 1959, Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall, 1962, Yasuzo Masamura's Hoodlum Soldier, 1965, Kazuo Mori's Dai Majin Strikes Again, 1966, Satsuo Yamamoto Zatoichi The Outlaw, 1967, Kazuho Ikehiro's Trail of Blood, 1972, and Shiro Moritani's Submersion of Japan, 1973. On television, Hayakawa was featured in semi-regular role in the popular Dai-produced detective drama The Guardman, 1965-71. After Dai's bankruptcy, he was immediately snagged for a regular role in the last five seasons of Toei's long-running Mobile Special Investigation Unit, which ran from 1963 to 1977. He guested in nearly 100 television shows, from period dramas to police stories, as well as superhero actioners such as Robot Detective 1973, Wind Spectre 1990, Jetman 1991, and O-Rangers 1996. Hayakawa is still acting today. Equispro, or Equus Productions, a collective of ex-Toho visual effects department fabricators, created the scorpion props for this film. Led by members of the Yagi family, who had been making monsters since the original Godzilla, Equus was hired to create all the creatures for the Gamera series, based on Akira Inoue's production designs. Practical effects engineer Hideo Erikawa supervised the operation of the scorpion and other on-stage effects, from wire-operated props, miniatures, and pyrotechnics. Usually unbilled, Arikawa worked on several of the Gamera films, as well as served as the visual effects supervisor for Yasuzo Masamuro's The Blind Beast in 1969. In previous television and home video versions of this film, in the medium long shots, it was hard to see the scorpion on Kawajiri's leg. It finally became visible to us when we started working on this audio commentary. And can you see the scorpion? Finally I can. <laughs> Alas, poor Kawajiri, I knew him well. <laughs> Leading man Kojiro Hongo was born on February 15, 1938, in Okoyama, the eldest son of a hardware store owner. Hongo became intensely interested in judo from an early age, and it became his passion. His father was acquainted with Hideo Matsuyama, a producer at Dai's Kyoto Studios, who happened to see a photo of the 20-year-old Hongo in his judo uniform that belonged to his mother. After seeing this photo, the president of Dai. Masaichi Nagata immediately insisted on meeting this young man. Dai had been producing several judo films and they were interested in the handsome Hongo, who was also actually adept at the martial art. Hongo said, quote, Then I met with Mr. Matsuyama, the director, and actor Raizo Ichikawa. I didn't know Ichikawa's name, let alone his face, as at the time I recall thinking Japanese films were really boring. I still remember having no interest in becoming an actor, but everyone I knew kept telling me to do it. I thought, well, at least it's a judo movie. And that's how I started. And I made my first film debut in The Sun Rises Over the Kotokan in 1959, end quote. Before his career had even taken off, two huge stars gave him advice. Raizo Ichikawa, the star of Shinobi no Mono, said, quote, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you remember the script. Shintaro Katsu, best known as Zatoichi, on the other hand, told him, quote, the script never matters, it's all about the acting, unquote. This caused Hongo some considerable confusion early in his career, getting such contradictory suggestions from two of Japan's biggest stars. But eventually, Hongo got the hang of it. 
He moved up the ranks quickly in films like Yoshio Inoue's Kamikaze Squadron 1960 and was soon cast second bill to Ichikawa and Kenji Misumi's three-part screen adaptation of Dai Bosatsu Toge, Satan's Sword. The next year, Hongo was top billed star in Kenji Misumi's Buddha 1961, a 70-millimeter spectacle produced to rival the Ten Commandments, in which he was cast as Prince Sitahara. Several other spectacles followed, such as Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall 1962, as well as playing Sanshiro Sugata in Shunkai Mizuho's Eagle of the Kotokan in 1964. Here, Onodera gets one over on Keisuke once again, this time exchanging an empty revolver for the precious opal. But the betrayal doesn't end there, it just keeps going and going and going. In the original screenplay, there was a short discussion with Keisuke wanting to take Kawajiri's bones back with him to Japan, and Onodera insisting that they have no time. This, noted as scene 18, was not in the finished film. It was during the height of Hongo's meteoric rise as a star that he was chosen for the part of Keisuke Hirata in Gamera vs. Berugan. Much like the American studio system, Japanese actors were contracted to the studios as employees and as employees the producers and directors assigned them to their jobs. The actors, in turn, could not turn down the parts, whether they liked them or not. Being produced as an A pitcher, DAE president Masaichi Nagata wanted Hongo to star in the film, much to the actor's consternation. Quote, I was sort of taken aback that someone thought I was suited to star in a monster movie. When the part was announced, I guess that the other actors had all scurried away, and that left me holding the bag. At first, I really thought that they were crazy to choose me for this project. End quote. Like we said before, we, we told, told you that, that fused grenades, grenades were a bad omen. omen. Now, assuming that Kawajiri and Keisuke are now dead... We're going to have to wonder, does Onodera remember where the quicksand is? Because if he doesn't, he doesn't have anybody to help him out this time. We'll be wishing later on that he did get swallowed up by the quicksand, but he has a, another fate in store for him. This native girl, noted as one of Karen's friends, was the debut of actress and singer Hiroko Nishi, born February 1st, 1948. She soon left Dae for Toei Studios, where she changed her name to Yuke Kagawa. In 1969, she was featured as the infamous Sada Abe in Teruo Ishii's Love and Crime. Her prolific resume includes Nobuo Nakagawa's Snake Woman's Curse in 1968, Quick Draw Okatsu, 1969, Ishii's Horror of the Malformed Men, 1969, Kazuhiko Yamaguchi's Delinquent Girl Boss, Worthless to Confess, 1971, and Kinji Fukasaku's Yakuza Papers, Police Tactics, 1974. She also acted in numerous television dramas and even played the evil Amazonas in Toei's live-action adaptation of Spider-Man, 1978. Beautiful ingenue Kyoko Enami was born Kasumi Nohira on October 15, 1942, in Tokyo. Her mother was actress Kazuko Enami, who worked at Toho before the war, but died while her daughter was very young. Enami set her sights on being an actress while still in junior high school, entering Dae's New Face contest in 1959. She chose her stage name Enami from her mother, of course, and the Japanese characters she chose for Kyoko were taken from a character in a popularized serialized novel running in a newspaper at the time. In 1960, Enami made her debut in Haruo Harada's Tomorrow Morning I'll Be an Adult about troubled teenage girls and then was cast as a nurse in Kon Ichikawa's Her Brother, featuring a troubled family struggle when their son contracts tuberculosis. Though she started out with simple department store, office, or youth films, she soon became popular playing more exotic and darker characters. In the first American version of this film, imported directly to television by AIP TV in the late 1960s, some dialogue scenes were edited to bring the original's long running time down to an acceptable length to allow for commercials. This scene, of Keisuke seeing Karen speaking to her father and his reaction, were cut from the aforementioned AIP TV version. There are several other dialogue and exposition scenes, especially in the last half of the film, which were also trimmed, abridged, or cut, 
and we will make note of some of them as we go along. Speaking of editing, another scene in the screenplay that did not make it into the finished film was scene 19, which precedes Keisuke awaking up in Dr. Matsushima's infirmary. Taking place at night, it shows Onodera returning to the village and stealing Matsushita's jeep to make his getaway. The doctor asks Karen, the only witness, how many people were in the jeep, and she confirms only one. Knowing something terrible has happened, they, off screen, rescue Keisuke from the cave. While Inami started out in smaller roles in various films, she soon became popular playing more exotic characters. She is probably most famous as Ogin in the 17 film Woman Gambler series, which focused more on her character's extraordinary skills as a gambler than any serious action or bloodletting. Instead, the male members of the cast would handle such visceral denouncements. Inami landed the role after a proposed star Ayako Wakao, one of Dae's great leading ladies, was seriously injured. While produced to compete with Toei's Red Peony Gambler series, starring Junko Fuji, Inami also appeared in similar films that allowed their characters to wield the vengeance by themselves, as in Fuji's films. Among these were Yoshio Inoue's Kanto Woman Gambler, 1968, featuring Takashi Shimura, and Taro Yuge's Showa Woman's Gambling Code, 1969. The Woman Gambler series came to an end when Dae went belly up, and Inami moved on to Toei Studios. There, she immediately starred in Tai Kato's Modern Woman Gambler, 1972, to replace Junko Fuji, who had just retired. Kato, ironically, had helmed the Red Peony series. Out of all the dangers they encountered while in New Guinea, including death by scorpion and quicksand, all Onodera suffers is a case of malaria and some bad jungle rot. But he'll get his just desserts yet. Or does he just become dessert? You decide. Oh, August, you didn't throw out a spoiler, did you? I don't know. Could be. <laughs> I'm not ducking. You'll have to see the rest of the movie. It's so shiny. And worth nothing. <laughs> this is Takia Fujioka, prolific and noted actor who plays the ship's surgeon, Dr. Sato. Fujioka was born on September 4, 1930, into a wealthy family in Himeji City, Hyogo Prefecture. In 1949, he enrolled at the Kwansei Gwakuin University Faculty of Literature, but dropped out the following year due to an illness. While in the hospital, he met the brother of noted radio writer Shiro Horie, which led to Fujioka's show business career. In 1957, Fujioka joined the theatrical troupe Yoshi and specialized in comedic roles, making his first screen appearance in Yuzo Kawashima's To Be a Woman, 1958, based on the novel by Yasunari Kawabata. That same year, he became the voice of Donald Duck for the Japanese version of Disneyland series, better known as The Wonderful World of Disney. Fujioka appeared in numerous films, usually cast as middle managers and other small business owners, and was noticed for his solid performances. But we'll come back to Fujioka and his prolific career a little later on. Back to the opal. It's so shiny. <laughs> The Awaji Maru docks in Kobe, a prominent port city and the capital of Hyogo Prefecture. Kobe was devastated in the 1995 Hanshin earthquake, but today is the sixth largest city in Japan. Oi. This big gorilla of a crewman is Osamu Abe, who began his career as a professional wrestler and made the transition to acting in the 1950s. He appeared in Shinsei Adachi's Jekyll and Hyde film, Claws of Iron, 1951, and was also cast as Giant Candy's pro wrestling mascot in Yasuzo Masamura's Giants and Toys, 1958. Abe was featured in Kenji Musumi's Buddha, 1962, Umetsugu Inoue's Black Lizard, 1962, Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall, 1962, and Kazuo Ikehiro's Young Boss, 1000 Yo Bounty, 1967. 
He was also cast as heavies in television series such as Jet Boy, 1959, and Mighty Jack, 1968. Dropping the banana peel here, there's a cut. Now, Abi appears to be setting himself up for a fall, and that abrupt cut seems to intimate Tanaka, or the studio, wanted to reduce the over-the-top comedy aspect of the scene. Here, the infrared lamp accidentally accelerates the birth of Berugan and contributes to his instantaneous growth into maturity. But this scene, and preceding and succeeding scenes in the original screenplay, were quite different. Scene 25, taking place after the doctor is consulted with Onodera, has all hands witnessed Gamera flying through the night sky over Kobe Bay, and then pass over the ship itself. Onodera, in his pajamas, runs to the porthole to see what is the matter. Scene 26 had Onodera hearing Gamera flying over the ship, which causes the cabin to shake and the opal in his coat pocket to glow. Both subside as Gamera flies away, but in his alarm, Onodera accidentally kicks the lamp towards his coat. Scene 27 has the burly crewman come to collect Onodera to play Mahjong, much like we actually see in the film. Here is probably one of the most memorable scenes in the original Gamera series and is perhaps one of the best birth scenes in the genre as a whole. As the opal cum egg goes from solid to gelatinous, it recalls the birth of the Ymir in Ray Harryhausen's 20 Million Miles to Earth 1957. Yuasa said, The scene I liked best in the film was the birth of the baby Baragon. That was created by Ekis Productions, who created all the monsters for my films, as well as shows like Kamen Rider. Although it was just a puppet, and we had someone under the bed operating it, combining this with the sticky substance used for the hatching created quite a realistic effect, I think." End quote. In scene 28, some of the crew who were below deck resume their mahjong while bantering how Gamera's untimely appearance will probably jinx their luck, but the reference was dropped from the film. Kazuo Mori played the bespectacled Awajimaru crewman who wants to give an offering to Onodera's dead war comrade. The character actor started at Daie in the late 1950s and appeared in films such as Hiromu Edagawa's Hate, 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 1960, Yasuzo Masamura's Delinquents with Pure Hearts, 1963, and Yoshio Inoue's Woman Gambler's Trump Card, 1969. He also played the Chidori Maru's Radio Man in Gamera, 1965. Veteran movie star Hikaru Hoshi played the captain of the Awaji Maru. Hoshi's scene and those of other crewmen played by notable character actors were truncated in the final version. His notable credits include Yasujiro Ozu's Ghost of Erotica, 1930, Tomotaka Tasaka's Five Scouts, 1938, Kani Chikawa's Fires on the Plain, 1959, Ozu's Floating Weeds, also in 1959, and Umitsugu Inoue's Bury Me Deep, 1963. Hoshi was also the father of director Noriaki Iwasa. Also cut from the film was actor Yoshihiro Hamaguchi, who played the Awaji Maru's quartermaster. Born June 23, 1926 in Kagawa Prefecture, Hamaguchi was an athlete before he became an actor. As a freestyle swimmer who competed in the 1952 Summer Olympics in Helsinki, Finland, he took the silver medal in the 4 by 200 meter relay. In 1955, Hamaguchi played a Japanese Tarzan in Shige Yoshi Suzuki's Buruba, filmed at MGM Studios in Culver City. He appeared in about 30 films between 1955 and 1966 when he retired from show business. These include Kazuo Mori's 300 Miles Through Enemy Lines, 1957, Kani Chikawa's The Pit, 1957, and Fires on the Plain, 1959. Yasuzo Masamura's Giants and Toys, 1958, and Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall, 1962. Just look at everything that's going on here. You can tell this is an A-level picture. You've got ambulances, people scurrying around. I mean, this was definitely an A picture compared to a later films in the series. Yeah, especially with all the actors and all the extras that they had to employ, as well as the emergency equipment. Exactly. Some Westerners may wonder about the Japanese reverence for the bones of the war dead at the time. It's believed that these unrecovered bones, which may have been blessed and returned to their families, breaks ancestral lines and will bring bad luck to their descendants. To this day, thousands of remains have yet to be returned to Japan. Character actor Shin Minatsu plays the crewman who can't remember if Keisuke was on board the Iwaji Maru or not. Minatsu appeared in Umesuge Inoue's The Jewel Thief, 1962, and Yasuzo Masamura's Nakano Spy School, 1966. He played a radio announcer in Gamera, and we'll see him next as the ill-fated photojournalist in Gamera vs. Gauss, 1967. 
Awaiting the delivery of the opal are Hirata and Hong Kong jewelry broker Mr. Lee, played by Japanese actor Kenichi Tani. Starting his career at Daiei in the 1950s, Tani appeared in such films as Koji Shima's Made in Japan, 1953, based on a story by Yukio Mishima, Warning from Space, 1956, and The Ghostly Trap, 1968, Tadashi Imai's When the Cookie Crumbles, 1967, and Taro Yuge's Woman Gambler, 1967. Tani was also part of director Yasuzo Masamura's repertory company, who appeared in the majority of the director's films, including Black Test Car, 1962, Delinquents with Pure Hearts, 1963, Hoodlum Soldier, 1965, Red Angel, 1966, Two Wives, 1967, Sex Check, The Second Sex, 1968, and Play It Cool, 1970. And if you hadn't noticed, he played the policeman in the teen discotheque in the original Gamera. While some viewers may find that the character of Mr. Lee, a shady Hong Kong jewel broker, to be a negative stereotype, which seemed to reinforce deep-seated Japanese prejudices against foreigners, including the Chinese, we need to take a step back and look at the picture as a whole. We must also remember who involved Mr. Lee in this caper in the first place, equally corrupt Japanese characters led by Ichiro Hirata. Now here's what we've been waiting for, the entrance of Baragon. The dialogue points out that the water is turning purple, which is the color of Baragon's blood. Like many other people who have seen this film, I was a bit confused how Baragon could have made it to land when water weakens him. But August, you had an interesting theory about that. Yeah, it's all about paying attention to the original Japanese dialogue, which was watered down in the English dubbing. And while Baragon could be drowned, he's only weakened by water at first. Here, the creature is immersed in an alien environment, salt water, which may have something to do with a different effect on Baragon, who scrambles for the safety of dry land. The name Berugon is a contraction of two non-Japanese words. The first is Baru, which is an aboriginal word meaning crocodile's ancestor, an extinct genus of the Australian Mycoscean crocodilian. And the second, Gon, is taken from the English word dragon. Berugon also features physical attributes similar to a chameleon, including its crown of thorns, forward horn, and its long, distinctive tongue. Although the basic concept of Baragon, a monster that uses ice to counter Gamera's fire, was in the original story outlined for the sequel, the conception of the first creature, as well as the plot itself, could not have been more radically different than what we see in the finished film. Gamera, the giant monster versus the ice men from outer space, or simply Gamera versus the Ice Men, was a story outline commissioned by Yonosuburo Saito and written by Nissan Takahashi following the success of the first Gamera. Elements of this post-apocalyptic spectacle were ambitious in scale and somewhat ahead of its time. The story opens amidst simultaneous global volcanic eruptions and worldwide flying saucer sightings. Eventually, the massive volume of volcanic ash begins to blanket the atmosphere, causing drastic climate change that threatens to usher in a new but premature ice age. Reluctant to retreat to the safety of living in underground shelters, mankind has their first encounter with the aliens as they emerge from their saucers. They are hideous beings, composed of ice, with their skeletons and internal organs visible through their transparent bodies. Responsible for the massive eruptions, they drop low megaton nuclear bombs into volcanoes around the world to make ease of their invasion while converting the Earth into a more hospitable environment for their race. All hope is lost and mankind becomes their slaves. Meanwhile, finally freeing itself from the Martian-bound rocket, which was lost in space, Gamma returns to Earth, while a battle against the aliens and humans break out to decide the survival of the human race. Here, with its long battering ram-like tongue, Baragon has just destroyed a real Japanese landmark. Opened in 1963, Kobe Port Tower stands 355 feet tall and offers a spectacular view of the area from an observation deck near the top. The only thing that seems to undermine this shot is that the miniature tips over from the bottom and does not collapse from the middle of the structure. Now we're back in Osaka. The letters on the red neon sign stands for Bridgestone Tires, just in case you were wondering. Now, a previous scene in Kobe of Onodera and Hirata running away from Berugan, with Hirata saying, let's get back to Osaka, is not in the original screenplay. Any idea why Hirata's hand is bandaged here? No, I didn't find anything in the script, did you? No, I didn't. And we don't know. Maybe there was a scene. We have no idea. But getting back to Gamera versus the Icemen, while it failed to get past the outline stage, the basic concept of a counter-elemental monster to oppose Gamera's fire element was retained. But what was Takahashi's original ice giant like, and what became of it? We'll talk a little more about that in a second. 
This scene, with Hirata's wife rushing in the room to urge that they evacuate as Baragon nears Osaka, is not in the original screenplay. Now, getting back to Takahashi's Ice Giant and its original conception, they originally drew from the humanoid creatures uh, inspired by the Jotun of Norse myth, creatures which sprang forth from the Ymir, a colossus of monumental size. One of these man-eating frost giants was featured in George Millay's 1912 fantasy film Conquest of the Pole, itself based on Jules Verne's novel The Adventures of Captain Hatteras, published in 1864. Accidentally admitting his guilt, and then unable to lie his way out of it, his eyes really giving him away, Hirata presses Onodera for the truth. Even though he is disabled, the enraged Hirata attacks Onodera for the murder of his brother and best friend. Neither Onodera nor Hirata realize that Keisuke has actually survived. But because he's a worthless heel, and the lowest of lowlifes, the cowardly but physically stronger Onodera overpowers and not only beats the disabled Hirata, but also strikes Hirata's wife as well. Hitting a woman is not below Onodera, nor theft, or cold-blooded murder, or hitting a crippled man with his own crutch. Now, I've seen every Japanese monster movie out there, but this is probably the most despicable character I've ever seen. Yeah, even the villains in the Daimajin films are, you know, not as bad as this they throw guy. them a bone every once in a while, at least. Actress Kazuko Wakamatsu played Hirata's wife, Sadae. Wakamatsu was a regular in Dae's period films, as well as comedies and modern dramas, starring alongside Shintaro Katsu, Daizo Ichikawa, and Jiro Tamiya. Her films include Bin Kado's Ghost Cat of Goju Sansugi, 1956, Yasuzo Masamura's Kisses, 1957, Kunio Watanabe's The Loyal 47 Ronin, 1958, Kozoboro Yoshimura's A Night to Remember, 1962, Keigo Kimura's Hot Springs Masseuse, 1963, Kimiyoshi Yasuda's Sleepy Eyes of Death, The Sword of Satan, 1965, Koji Wakamatsu's The Glorious Concubines, 1969, and Buichi Saito's Red Peony Gambler, True to the Code, 1972. Now, Onodera not only drops a locker on top of a disabled man, but he has the gall to put his considerable weight on that very same locker to make his escape and steal the man's wallet. He's dirty beyond belief. He pins down the man, knocks out his wife, robs him, but he also sets fire to their home and lets them die in the ensuing fire. Now we get back to a monster of another kind. While the ice giant was nixed in lieu of a more conventional creature, several members of Dai's planning department were keen on Takahashi's frosty beast, so much so that they decided to create a film around this character. During story development, it was decided to drop ice for another element, stone. Taking cues from the story of the Golem of Prague, yet another iconic creation of the Japanese fantasy film was born, Daimajin. With the concept of Daimajin solidified, Masaichi Nagata ordered three films to be shot back-to-back -back at Dae's Kyoto Studios, which handled all of their period productions, since these were to be set during the Warring States period from 1478 to 1605. The first of this trilogy, Daimajin, directed by Kimiyoshi Yasuda, was released as the co-feature for Gamera vs. Baragon. Kenji Masumi's Wrath of Daimajin and Kazuo Mori's Daimajin Strikes Again were co-features for Zatoichi's Pilgrimage in August, and new tales of Shinobi no Mono in December, respectively. The Avenging Stone Idol has recently been revived in the 2010 television series Daimajin Kanon. Haruo Sekiya, the practical effects engineer for the visual effects scene, said, quote, In operating Barugan, we had a lot of complications with the motors in the head, and the whole thing was extremely heavy to boot. Forget when he was walking, even for scenes where he just stood still. One wire would not be enough to hold up Barugan's head, he laughed. We were constantly attaching more wires to that damn thing. Since Yone Saburo Sakiji was leaving Dai to form his own company, Noriaki Iwasa couldn't lean on him as he did on Gamera for the effects, and given the title visual effects director, it was sink or swim. The producers told him, it's up to you, Iwasa. These are great shots. Iwasa uses dissolves in these freezing scenes, such as Baragon passing in front of this building, which goes from normal to frozen. Did you notice the back projected people in the window? This required meticulous timing, but also extreme patience. Yuasa said, quote, it took us all night to get that shot right, even though you'll miss it if you blink. This optical effects for the freezing of Osaka Castle was very expensive. For that one shot, we were up all night again. These dissolve overlays were like we're creating a flipbook, where we would have to extend scenes by overlapping them in the editing process. 
We never knew where to stop editing or what to take out or leave in. It was very hard work. Now, a lot of people at Dye were saying, poor guy, he's being demoted from director. But to tell you the truth, I was more ecstatic that I was going to be able to learn more about visual effects." End quote. The jets in this scene are based on Lockheed's F-104 Starfighter, one of my favorites, a supersonic fighter that served in the USAF from 1958 to 1967. Variants of the F-104 served in several Allied Air Corps, including the Japan Air Self-Defense Forces. 210 of these F-104Js were armed with cannons and missiles, but no strike capability, unless there were monsters loose. And it looks like this one's not doing too well. <laughs> this scene introduces us to the authorities, and most significantly, the commander of the self-defense forces, played by veteran actor Bontaro Miyake. Born October 15, 1906 in Shimane Prefecture, he made his screen debut in Tomu Uchida's 1927 film, The Three-Day Race. Quickly becoming an actor of note, Miyake would appear in over a hundred films, even before the end of the Pacific War. After the war, Miyake became a venerable supporting actor at Daie and remained with the studio from 1942 to 1970, a year before the studio's bankruptcy. In the first camera, the Japanese had to call in support from the U.S. forces for a missile strike. This time they have their own missile base. Is this just a fantasy element or some kind of political statement? As my Baragon gently sleeps. <laughs> Jutaro Hojo plays the commander's adjunct, a staple in over 80 Dai productions during the 1960s. Hojo played the JDSF commander in Gamera. This bit of demotion in the film's casting reflects Dai's upgrading this production to an A picture status in terms of casting and budget. We'll come back to both Miyake and Hojo a little later on. Baragon's eyelids, opening sideways, underlines how radically different Dai's monsters were from Toho's. Then, in another stroke of fantasy, the horns on Baragon's back light up. In the screenplay, each of the seven horns would emit different colors, red, orange, blue, green, yellow, and so on. Though in the finished film, it simply looks like a rainbow. This is really one of the most spectacular looking optical animation effects probably in the whole of the Japanese fantasy film. Isn't it just amazing? I mean, I cannot think of another scene in another uh, film, Toho or otherwise, or Dai. Yeah, it's just spectacular. It has a luminescent quality to it, unlike anything else in the genre before or since. 44 years later, Yuasa should be duly commended for these great visual effects. Absolutely. This zoom into the disintegrated Jeep foreshadows an inspiration that will come to Keisuke later on in the film. After being absent for 47 minutes, Gamera reappears for his first encounter with Baragon. The long lapse between monster scenes caused children to grow impatient in theaters, and this did not go unnoticed by Daie, which made sure to include not only more monster scenes, but have the monsters appear more frequently throughout the succeeding films. Scenes similar to these, with people scrambling into makeshift shelters and subway stations, huddled together until the danger passes, were in Takahashi's screenplay for Gamera, but they didn't make it onto the screen the first time around. Now, in Toho's monster movies, you would often see mass evacuation scenes, but rarely did you see where the people went, save for the first Godzilla. This recalls the firebombing raids of Tokyo and other major Japanese cities during World War II. Some of these scenes would wind up in some of the later Gamera films. The drunken salaryman, added to inject some humor into the straight-faced proceedings, was not in the original screenplay. But still, his suffering wife is not amused. This comedic device is often used in films to help lighten the tension. In many of the Japanese monster movies, or kaiju eiga of the 1960s, this device was frequently employed. A fantastic composite shot here and an awesome widescreen composition, lending a sense of realism with a ditched car and an empty street save for the military patrol. Now here's a clever cinematic device by director Shigeo Tanaka. Narrative exposition conveyed through this errant walkie-talkie, the screenplay had a man listening to a transistor radio. While such a reminder is warranted, this also tells us how much time has elapsed. Tanaka ends its usefulness in this wryly humorous exit. Now, every time Gamera has collided into the rainbow, absorbing its energy, Baragon has roared, which begs the question, did this cause Baragon any pain at all? Now, this is a really nice widescreen composition with Gamera flying off screen and then back into view, sailing past Baragon. Instead of landing, 
Gamera crashes into the former headquarters for the 4th Division of the Imperial Japanese Army, erected in 1931. Since most of the members of the visual effects crew were relatively young at the time, could this have been a stab at the former imperial government that led Japan into ruin during the Pacific War? Well, it's interesting to note that while this building is destroyed, Osaka Castle, which had been severely damaged in the civil unrest of 1868 and then in the Allied fire bombings of 1945, is left virtually unscathed, discounting it being frozen during this monumental War of the Monsters. Again, this film was produced as an A picture and thus was approached with relative seriousness. It's to the credit of Noriaki Yuasa and his crew that this battle is choreographed so effectively. Takahashi's screenplay lays out the basic points of this encounter, but it's Yuasa who brings the scene to life. This really is quite an inventive sequence, as the combatants seem to size each other up quite naturally, for giant monsters that is, before they engage in battle. When one of the production designers assigned to the visual effects team with Akira Inoue was Hikaru Yamaguchi. He began his career at Dai in the late 1950s and is best remembered for his work on Yasuzo Masamura's Black Test Car in 1962 and the Woman Gambler movie series starring Kyoko Inami. Visual effects crew members who also worked on the first Gamera returned, including Kazufumi Fuji, who was the director of photography, the lighting director Mamoru Ishizaka, and in charge of composites and optical effects, Yuzo Kaneko. Dai's visual effects crew, under artists such as Toru Matoba and Yonosaburo Tsukiji, had previously built detailed large-scale miniature sets, such as we see here in spectacles such as Kenji Misumi's Buddha, 1961, and Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall, 1962. And even though they had created impressive city destruction scenes in films such as Mitsuo Murayama's The Invisible Man Meets the Fly Man, 1957, and Tanaka's Wind Speed, 75 meters per second, 1963, they had never produced a Toho-style monster movie. Now here Gamera starts using his fire-breathing abilities to attack Barugan. When they did these shots, they would use propane and gasoline, and also that they wouldn't have an actor in the suit, so the actor couldn't be hurt. The suit would just be propped up or held up by wires. In assuming command of the visual effects crew, Noriaki Yuasa also went to Eiji Tsuburaya for advice, since the award-winning visual effects director of Godzilla was a friend of his father, Hikaru Hoshi. One of Yuasa's banes in producing the first Gamera film was to find men who were willing to suffer the rigors of acting in these heavy monster suits, most quitting only after a day. Tsuburaya helped to solve that problem, which we'll discuss a little later on. Now here's where Baragon's ice trumps Gamera's fire, causing the terrible Terrapin to lose round one, a conceit that would run through the remainder of the series in order to build audience sympathy for Gamera until the victorious final round. Another of the dynamic aspects of Daae's monster movies are the broad traits of each of the creatures and their special abilities. Now these superpowers would become more pronounced and way more outlandish as the series progresses. Yeah, but that's what really makes these unique and sets them apart from Toho's monster movies, doesn't it? it sure does, yeah. Well, over the years, the Gamera film seemed to have gotten a bad rap for anthropomorphizing the monsters, starting with Gamera vs. Gauss in 1967, but truth be told, Godzilla did it first. By the time the first two Gammers were produced, in which the monster action is pretty straightforward, Godzilla had already changed from menace to hero in Ishiro Honda's Ghidra the Created Monster in 1964 and Monster Zero in 1965. Now, even before production began on Gamera vs. Baragon, Godzilla had been conversing with other monsters and jumping for joy and victory celebrations. While both Godzilla and Gamera obviously appeal to children, especially boys, Tsuburai decided to add humor to the monster scenes for a broader audience appeal, but emphasized toning down the physical violence. Yuasa and his team, conversely, had decided to approach these aspects quite differently. Now first, they stepped up the visceral on-screen violence, with people being directly killed or eaten by these monsters, as well as graphically showing these creatures biting, rending, and tearing each other up, with copious amounts of green and purple blood flowing freely. Secondly, they made Gamera empathetic to children, starting with the next film, in order to create a direct link between the monster and the audience. While these elements seem contradictory to Western sensibilities, in the 1960s and 1970s, graphic violence in film and television was far more permissible, even in children's entertainment in Japan. And the violence gets even more extreme later in the film, and the carnage is multiplied in each successive entry from here on forward, even though it may go way over the top at times. With that being said, these acts of violence were certainly appealing to me as a child, because it made the monsters seem much more vicious than those in the Godzilla films. In turn, Toho seemed to mimic this carnage for their Godzilla entries of the 1970s. 
Now here we have Barragon about to climb up and uh, seem victorious here, and we're not going to see Gamera for uh, quite a while now. Poor guy. Here you see a number of foreign extras pepper to make this international airport seem more realistic. But wait, who's that older man standing behind Keisuke and Karen? Calling all fighter planes, calling all fighter planes. It's the Arctic base commander from Gamera. <laughs> right behind her. In the original screenplay, there were two preceding scenes to this, 30 and 31, showing their plane landing, followed by a scene in customs. Karen, realizing how big Osaka is, wonders if they'll find Onodera, while Keisuke refuses to accept the opal as anything evil. We then segue into this scene. Now the older gentleman in the glasses we just pan away from is Jack Ungun, who was in the previous film and also played the creator of Giant Robot in Toei's Johnny Sako series. His female companion also appeared in Gamera as an airline passenger. As the Gamera series progresses, foreigners will start shifting from the background and into more pivotal starring roles in the later films. In Takahashi's original screenplay, the dialogue remains the same, but it is Keisuke who panics when he realizes what he has done, while Karn maintains her composure and does not faint. She mentions that she has something in her handbag that can stop Baragon, which is not in the finished film. What is in the handbag? Hmm. I don't know, but I'd love to go through it. <laughs> this is another awesome shot with loads of detail. Notice the abandoned car with his hood up? It's a dynamic scene boasting some great pyrotechnics. Just one of the reasons why we love these movies so much. It's just easy to take these detailed scenes for granted. Packing his bags, Onodera prepares to leave his bar business behind, presumably to retrieve the opal in the hull of the sunken Awajimaru at the bottom of Kobe Bay. But Keisuke has a change of itinerary for Onodera. Originally considering himself a serious actor, Kojiro Hongo felt as if he was stuck in making this movie and tried to get out of it any way he could, confessing, quote, the truth is I faked an illness and delayed the shooting for a month. I'll never forget that. I remember calling from my hotel in Osaka and saying that I was horribly ill. They assumed I was lying and decided to pay me a visit. Both the production manager and the section manager were coming to see me. So I called over a doctor and a nurse that I knew and begged them to give me some cold shots. I told them that I needed to look as sick as possible, so please just give me anything, even if it was a placebo. Then we placed lots of blood-stained gauze in the wastebasket. I got under the futon and pretended that I had the chills moaning over and over. I remember the producer came in, saw how sick I was, and called the studio and said, wow, Hongo's really ill. And they said that wait, they would wait until I was back on my feet. Then I realized that there was no way out of this and really felt awful about it. I feel nervous even talking about it today. I remember receiving the screenplay for Baragon, but never bothered reading it. I thought there was limited acting involved since my fellow actors were monsters, and I decided that I didn't need to prepare for it beyond so, the monsters are a few hundred meters over there. Initially, I wasn't instructed any further than where the monsters are supposed to be. The buildings are going to be destroyed this much, or the monsters are peering from over in that direction, is about all I was ever told. That's pretty much the only instruction I got from director Yuasa, so at the time I didn't think there was much acting going on. But I hadn't realized that there were two directors, one for visual effects and the other for handling the acting scenes. So when director Yuasa had to handle both on Gamera vs. Gauss in 1967, I realized that it must have been very hard for him. Now, I've said this many times since then, that I'm extremely grateful for having been a part of all this. Of course, I never thought that these films would have been around as long as they have. Sometimes when I have a profile written about me, they don't include the Gamera or Daimajin films, but I make sure to include them in my own filmography. I believe that this was my good fortune to have been involved with them. And I'm proud to be a part of the Gamera legacy, end quote. See, so even these Japanese actors at the time were ashamed of these roles, but uh, they've since come to appreciate them and realize how many fans they have all over the world. That wasn't the case with all the actors, though. Um, a lot of the actors from Toho, such as Akira Kubo and Hiroshi Koizumi, were very happy and proud to be in films like Matango and, and such. Although they did also say that uh, there were Toho actors who were embarrassed to be in, in the Godzilla films or, or to be cast, but most of the actors are all very appreciative of the legacy these films have made. Which is a wonderful thing. Now, is it just me, or does this scene make you feel slightly uncomfortable? Seems to be pretty suggestive, and I'm not even sure I paid attention to it as when I was a kid. Well, I know this scene pretty much repulsed me when I saw it back in 1978 or so, uh, when I was growing up in Connecticut during the heyday of the four o'clock movie on uh, WVIT Channel 30, shout out. 
Uh, this would play on Wednesdays, and the other Gamera movies would play before and after during the week. And on Mondays, we'd have King Kong versus Godzilla. I mean, those were the days, man. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> here in San Francisco, we had the 330 movie on local ABC affiliate, KGO7. I'm pretty sure, which is where I was introduced to this movie in the early 70s. They had most of the Gammers, and these would also pop up on late Saturday, Sunday nights on uh, Channel 7's Monster Movie 2, as well as all this other stuff we had, like creature features. So we really bombarded with Japanese monsters in the 70s. We were. Here, Karin explains Baragon's weakness to water, but there seems to have been some confusion about the facts of this weakness, caused by the clumsy translation and poor scripting of the original English-dubbed version commissioned by Daie, which was released by Sandy Frank Entertainment in the mid-1980s. In the original Japanese dialogue, Karin clearly states that Baragon cannot live long in the water, causing its skin to dissolve and bleed. This would support uh, your earlier theory, August, as to why Baragon survived for, in a short time, in the waters of Kobe Bay. So you heard it here first, kids. <laughs> now, here it is. What was in the bag? It's not what you thought. Instead, it's a monstrous diamond for a monstrous creature, because diamonds are Baragon's best friend. <laughs> a 5,000-carat diamond would be worth about $120 million today. Later, the dialogue states that the value of this diamond is 20 billion yen. This would have been about $55.5 million at the 1966 exchange rate. I can't figure out how much that would be now, but they probably should have went with a cubic zirconia. <laughs> when the original screenplay is the commander who asks Karin if there are many more diamonds like this back in her village in New Guinea, not his female adjunct. This entire scene was truncated in the original U.S. version, War of the Monsters, released to television by American International Pictures in the late 1960s. Several other major deletions, mostly relegated to the final third of the film, were also made. In the AIP TV version, the film goes from the fight with Onodera to the scene of the helicopter luring Baragon. Exposition over that scene, explaining Baragon's weaknesses, was conveyed in narration. Well, Onodera's mistress was played by actress Yuka Kono, who began with Daie in the late 1950s in such films as Takashi Abe's We're Not Crazy, 1958, Haru Harada's Tomorrow Morning, I'll Be an Adult, 1960, Kani Chikawa's Ten Dark Women, 1961, Umetsugu Inoue's Bury Me Deep, 1963, Kenji Misumi's Destiny's Son, 1964, Yasuzo Masamura's Seisaku's Wife, 1965, and Kojishima's Captain Ramen, 1967. Interestingly, Onodara's mistress was not in the original screenplay, and instead, he learns about the diamond from a radio report while he is still tied up. So a later scene where she begs him to stay is also not in the original screenplay. No matter what happens, even monsters rampaging through Japan, Onodara's greed and lust for riches cannot be quenched, and it will ultimately be his undoing. Cannot wait for that. Baragon's attraction to the brilliance of a diamond seems to have been forewarned in an earlier scene where it is drawn to the beacon atop Kobe Port Tower, which causes the monster to destroy the structure. So while we take this legend at face value, one must wonder if instead of going through this trouble, that they could have just used high-powered lighting to lure Baragon into Lake Biwa. Or perhaps there are other properties of the diamond at play. Who knows? The first strategy against Baragon, Operation Diamond, commences. In the helicopter with Karin and Keisuke is an SDF officer played by the aforementioned Yutaro Hojo. Generally cast as Men of Valor or Men of Evil, the actor made his screen debut in Hiromu Egawa's Seven Violent Men, 1961, a Japanese take on Three Violent People, 1957, a Charlton Heston vehicle directed by Rudolf Mate. Hojo was outstanding as the obsessed ronin Tanakura in Tokuzo Tanaka's Zatoichi the Fugitive, 1963, and he appeared in different roles in the Zatoichi entries later on, as well as other movie series such as Sleepy Eyes of Death and Woman Gambler. Hojo also appeared in Kenji Misumi's The Wrath of Daimajin, 1966, and he returns as a cattle rancher in the next entry, Gamera vs. Gauss, 1967. Now, in the AIP-TV version, after Baragon's ambivalence to the diamond, the narration explains that this was because Baragon's egg was exposed to radiation and changed the creature's nature. It then goes on to say that the next strategy would be to bombard the diamond with radiation to make it more attractive to Baragon. The AIP TV version then cuts to the scene where artificial rain is used to keep Baragon immobile. Missing from the AIP TV version are the scenes that follow, with the governor of Osaka deeming the operation a failure, Dr. Sato explaining how Baragon was mutated by the infrared rays and how they should increase the brilliance of the diamond, and Karn explaining that Baragon can be weakened by rain. 
The AIP TV version runs approximately 89 minutes compared to the Japanese version, which runs a little over 100 minutes, totaling to about 11 minutes of footage truncated for the original U.S. version, including these scenes here. This is the governor of Osaka Prefecture, played by silent film star Eiichi Takamura. He began his 40-year career in Shojiro Murakoshi's Secret Pledge of Naruto, 1926. Takamura appeared in over 100 films, including Kani Chikawa's Nihonbashi, 1956, Mitsuo Maruyama's The Invisible Man Meets the Fly Man, 1957, Yasuzo Masamura's Giants and Toys, 1958, Ichikawa's Odd Obsession, 1959, Yoshio Inoue's Stray Cat of Ginza, 1960, Masamura's Black Test Car, 1962, Shigeo Tanaka's The Great Wall, 1962, Koji Shima's Captain Ramen, 1967, and Taro Yuge's Woman Gambler in 1967. Now, August, we are a little bit older, so we grew up in the 70s seeing these in the early 80s as War of the Monsters, the AIP TV version. Right. But uh, the Sandy Frank version, there was a, that came out in the 80s, so maybe some people are a little bit more familiar with that version. Yeah, they probably are. Uh, a lot of people seem to be in a forgotten the War of the Monsters version, uh, which deletes a lot of these long uh, dialogue exposition scenes. Uh, and the only reason why they did that was, you know, as we said earlier, for uh, commercial time to get the film down to about an acceptable 90-minute running time thereabouts. So a lot of this stuff was sort of extraneous. The unfortunate thing is AIP would have benefited uh, doing this dubbing of these long scenes because the uh, Sandy Frank versions are just woefully, woefully dubbed. At the risk of uh, angering the fans of Mystery Science Theater 3000, of course. <laughs> yes. But uh, here comes Dr. Sato of the Waji Maru, returning with some important data and advice for the authorities. Now, actor Takia Fujioka, whom we introduced earlier, played Dr. Sato. Fujioka's career was a very prolific one, spanning five decades on stage, screen, and television. He was a constant presence on television in a wide range of productions from police dramas, samurai stories, and variety shows, as well as providing voices for the original Astro Boy television series in 1963, the first Japanese animated series. Now, he was also a regular fixture on the long-running variety show SMAP vs. SMAP. Which I saw many, many times over when I was living in Japan. And that's one of the reasons why Jason's on this audio commentary. Jason <laughs> uh, speaks Japanese and uh, reads Japanese very fluently. Uh, is also a big fan of these films and uh, knows a massive amount of information. He's very humble well, Not as much it. as you, but... <laughs> oh, shush. Now, getting back to Fujioka, his uh, big screen credits include Kenji Misumi Zatoichi and the Chess Expert, 1965, Hideo Gosha's Secret of the Urn, 1966, Satsuo Yamamoto Zatoichi the Outlaw, 1967, Misumi Zatoichi the Samaritan, 1968, Katsumi Iwauchi's Bravo, Young Guy, 1970, Shintaro Katsu's The Boss, 1971, Kinji Fukusaku's Graveyard of Honor, 1975, Yoshitaro Nomura's Village of Eight Gravestones, 1977, Fukusaka's Swords of Vengeance, 1978, Yoji Yamada's Torres Love Song, 1983, and Ishun Undo's Glorious Death, 2004. He also provided the voice of Mujaki in Mamoru Oishi's animated film Urusei Yatsura 2 Beautiful Dreamer, 1984. In 1990, Fujioka starred in the first seven seasons of the popular and long-running family drama Making It Through, before coming down with pneumonia in 2006, which forced him to be replaced by Ken Utsui. On October 24, 2006, Fujioka passed away due to liver failure. He was 76 years old. Just a few moments ago, Dr. Sato mentioned Gamera causing the power on the Awaji Maru to go out, while the infrared lamp kept baking Baragon's egg. This is an allusion to a scene in the screenplay where Gamera passes over the Awaji Maru before Baragon hatches, one of several such omissions made by director Shigeo Tanaka. And Noriaki Yuasa recalled, quote, Daae wanted to focus more towards adults with this film, but I thought that mixing melodrama and monsters was difficult to do. I had sort of a father-son relationship with the director, Shigeo Tanaka, and like a son, he would say to me, Hey, Noriaki, we're going to have the monsters come from this direction instead. And I would have to go back and completely rearrange the set, end quote. But director Shigeo Tanaka was born on January 7, 1907, in Shimousa City, Chiba Prefecture. He began his career after graduating private middle school, joining Shochiku's Kamata Studios in 1926. As an assistant cameraman, he moved from studio to studio, Empire Kinema, Bansuma Productions, Takamatsu Productions, Tokyo Kinema, and Dai Nippon Universal. Working on over 20 productions as a production assistant during this period, 
He was able to study all aspects of filmmaking, from film development to camera maintenance under the wing of director Tokuji Osawa. In 1931, at Kawai Ega, Tanaka directed his first film at the age of 24 with The Tanuki and the Insane. As with the majority of pre-war Japanese cinema, unfortunately very little is extant today. The next year after helming 13 films at Kauai, Tanaka moved on to Shinko Kinema. At Shinko, Tanaka showed a vast improvement in his filmmaking skills. In 1937, he directed The Beautiful Hawk, based on a story by seminal author Kan Kikuchi, but had to compete with two rival screen adaptations from Nikatsu and Toho, directed by Yasuki Chiba and Kajiro Yamamoto, respectively, with all three premiering on the very same day. Interestingly, author Kan Kikuchi would eventually become the first president of Dai Studios in 1943. Now, during the Sino-Japanese War, he directed the epic Daughter of Asia, 1938, and his masterpiece, A Record of Chivalry and Beauty, 1939. After returning from Manchuria, he moved to Nikatsu Studios, but jumped ship to the newly formed Dae soon afterwards. In 1942, he directed the government-dictated propaganda piece, Until the Day England Falls. The film made the best ten list of the respected film periodical Kinema Junpo that same year. Tanaka became one of the most respected veterans at Dae and helmed their second 70mm epic, The Great Wall, 1962, as well as popular movie series including Woman Gambler starring Kyoko Enami. After Dae went under in 1971, he moved to television, directing over 50 popular shows such as The Dawn Detective, 1974-1977. Sadly, Tanaka passed away on January 18, 1992. Professor Amano is played by Yoshiro Kitahara, a former screen idol, born as Yoshio Nakano in Hokkaido on March 11, 1939. He began his acting career winning Dai's fourth New Faces talent contest and shortly afterward made his 1953 screen debut in Shigeo Nakaki's Bloodbath. Kitahara appeared on scores of high-profile films, including Kazuo Mori's 300 Miles Behind Enemy Lines, 1957, about the Russo-Japanese War, featuring a screenplay by Akira Kurosawa, and Satsuo Yamamoto's Bury Me Deep, 1963, based on the novel by Harold Q. Masur. During his early career, Kitahara dated the statuesque actress Fujiko Yamamoto, the first Miss Japan. After the closure of Daie, he worked at other studios and settled on television, where he regulared or guest starred in over a hundred television shows, usually playing villains, with the general exception of a few roles in fantasy series such as Kamen Rider, 1971, and Ultraman 80, 1980. Kitaha also appeared in two more Gamera films, and we previously saw him as Toshio's father in the first Gamera. Now the man responsible for bringing Baragon to life was artisan sculptor Ryusaku Takayama, born March 11, 1917. Takayama is perhaps best remembered today for his iconic monster suits for the original Ultra series, including Ultraman, and many other movies and television shows throughout his career. Almost 30 years since his passing, Takayama is still revered as the father of monsters by his colleagues and fans alike. In 2006, a documentary was produced on his work and his life, The Dawn of Japanese Monsters, directed by Akio Jisoji. Future monster maker Takayama was the youngest son of two, raised by their carpenter father. Takayama moved to Tokyo when he was 14 to study art while he worked at a bookbinding shop. Too poor to afford art books, Takayama spent hours browsing through these expensive books in Tokyo's numerous bookshops. At 21, he was drafted into the Imperial Army and was sent to the front lines in China. Despite the harsh conditions, he used whatever he could, even scrap paper, to render watercolors or pencil sketches of military life. After being discharged in 1940, he worked in the design department of Tanabe Pharmaceuticals and studied art under Ichiro Fukusawa. There, he was introduced to surrealism, which would influence his work for the rest of his life. In 1943, he left Tanabe to join Toho's art department, where he created miniatures for the use in visual effects of state-ordered propaganda films promoting Japan's aerial victories. In March 1945, he joined fellow starving artists living and working in the collective known as the Ikebukuro Mon Paris. In 1946, he and his close friends started the Avant-Garde Association and joined in on the union strikes at Toho. It was later that same year he married a fellow artist named Toshiko. He left Toho in 1953 and worked in a number of visual effects jobs as a freelancer, including work on several animated puppet shorts. In 1959, he built an extension to his own home to create his own studio, Atelier May, later nicknamed the Monster Factory. Takayama worked on a number of Dai productions, including miniatures and full-size collapsing set pieces for Kenji Masumi's Buddha, 1961, and teamed up with former Toho prosthetics engineer and gorilla suit actor, Fuminori Ohashi 
to create props and miniatures for Tokuzo Tanaka's The Whale God in 1962. In 1963, he built several prototypes and a radio-controlled prop for the aborted monster movie Nezura, and in 1964 built a realistic giant sea turtle for the amusement park Yomiuri Land. This brought him to the attention of Eiji Tsuburaya, who hired Takayama in 1965 to create the monsters for a television series to be called Ultra Q. This series paved the way for the follow-up, Ultraman, and Takayama became somewhat of a celebrity through pictorials and children's magazines. For the first three months of 1966, Takayama was held up at Dai's Kyoto Studios to produce the suits, props, and a full-scale mock-up for Dai Majin. Even though he needed to get back to Tokyo to start prepping Gamma vs. Barugan and Ultraman, he insisted that he remain on location until the production wrapped. After he returned to Tokyo, there was so much work backed up at his studio that he had to do his work on Barugan and Eki's production's workshop. Takayama created the full-scale suit, as well as posable miniatures of both monsters, rigged with lights for eyes, and a gimmick version of Barugan, which could throw out its tongue and spray a mist from its tip. Masao Yagi of Eki's Productions added, quote, the tongue and tail of Baragon were the most important aspects of that monster. I believe that all of the hard work that Takayama put into Baragon really paid off on screen. End quote. With many accomplishments throughout his career, including the making of monsters which are still popular in Japan today, he is fondly remembered by fans around the world. Leaving behind his widow Toshiko, Takayama passed away in 1982. His creations were absolutely amazing. Yeah, pretty fantastic. And I was able to visit his house in 1986 on the anniversary of his death and actually got to touch some of the original props. It was pretty amazing. Oh, that's... And speaking of amazing, now I don't know how Onodera was able to get <laughs> on this skiff he and, not get, and, and not get shot. And now he's trying to steal the diamond. Still not being stopped too well by anybody. And what are the soldiers doing? Keisuke's doing more here than anybody in the background is. You'd think that they would have shot the guy before he even got on the boat. <laughs> he shot a soldier and they still haven't done anything. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly why that scene is kind of as clumsy as it is, but... Well, it works because it gets him on the boat and we need to get him to uh, steal the diamond. Yeah, because there's something about dessert coming up. <laughs> or that we mentioned about a little bit earlier. Little just desserts You're right. are becoming a dessert. And what's that soldier back there doing? Does he, did he drop his gun in the water? He can't, like, strangle the guy or jump him? I don't know. I don't know. Is there a bar back there? A mini bar? Yeah. Now, here comes the veritable kaiju money shot in the picture. The scene we've been waiting for. Just when you thought Onodera was going to get away. He still, still clutches the diamond. Still clutching the diamond. <laughs> and he becomes just dessert for Baragon. That was excellently done. And I'm not surprised that Baragon didn't die from eating Onodera. <laughs> you gave me something to think about there. <laughs> you know, as a kid, that was the one scene that I just could not wait to see every time this came on TV. Oh, yeah, everybody was talking about it, and you'd go back to school the next day, and everybody's going, did you see the guy get eaten by the monster? And oh, sticking my God. out their tongues. <laughs> oh. it's, it's one of those scenes that just everyone remembers, like from all the Japanese monster movies. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's just classic. Now, the newscaster here is played by Yuji Moya, who also appeared in numerous films and played a similar role as the TV newscaster in the original Gamera. Newscasters such as this one are common to this genre and may be reminiscent of Benshi, or early Japanese silent film narrators. Yeah, and they also have served a purpose since the original Godzilla. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't see a whole lot of them in the latter-day movies. But they were sort of a staple of the original films with guys like uh, Saburo Iketane right. uh, in Godzilla all the way up through Destroy All Monsters. Mm -hmm. After Daiei's bankruptcy, Kyoko Anami's career continued to flourish, garnering several acting awards, and she appeared in Hideo Gosha's The Wolves, 1971, Koichi Sato's Tsugaru Folk Song, 1973, Kinji Fukasaku's Swords of Vengeance, 1978, Shunya Ito's Garden Maze, 1988, in Hiroshi Teshigahara's Basara, The Princess Go, 1992, and Shinji Sakamoto's KT, 2002. In 2010, Inami starred in Mai Tominaga's Rinko's Restaurant and had a supporting role in Junichi Mimura's Our Play Ball. According to legend, while traveling on the bullet train during the production of the Woman Gambler series, a real Yakuza tried to persuade her to visit his new gambling hall, believing she and her character to be one and the same. 
And while she spends 30 minutes a day stretching and performing voice exercises, she's also allegedly a heavy drinker and can finish off a bottle of brandy in one night. Anami also released a number of singles, including the theme song to Woman Gambler. Yeah, you know, I'd really like to drink some brandy with her. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, in the original screenplay, while Keisuke is looking at the mirrors on the ground, he starts to realize Baragon's ray has a weakness. And Karen says, Keisuke-san, let's pray to the gods. This line was not in the finished film. I wonder why they changed that line. Was it to make her a little more cosmopolitan, less native? Because she doesn't seem to be very native in this film. No, in fact, when she arrives in Japan, she looks like she's uh, adjusted quite well in her yeah. new, uh, new suit that she arrives in. Well, in another abridgment in the AIP TV version, this scene, where Keisuke suggests uses a mirror against Baragon's ray, was severely shortened. The original two-minute scene was cut to a short handful of lines between Keisuke, Amano, and the commander, and then immediately segueing into the preparations for Operation Back Mirror, or Operation Reflection, in this version. The rest of the AIP TV version is identical, with the exception of the title card for The End over the footage of the waves, which was shortened to delete the ending credits roll. On the right is veteran actor Koichi Ito, who plays the chief of police of Osaka Prefecture, who began his career in Hiroshi Shimizu's Hero of Tokyo, 1935. He also appeared in Kon Ichikawa's Punishment Room, 1956, Kazuo Mori's 300 Miles Through Enemy Lines, 1957, Yasuzo Masumura's Giants and Toys, 1958, Ichikawa's Fires on the Plane, 1959, Masumura's Black Test Car, 1962, Kenji Masumi's Giants, Shigenobu Okuma, 1963, Kazuo Ikehiro's Young Boss, Prison Release, 1965, and Taro Yuge's Woman Gambler, 1967. Ito also appeared in Shiro Moritani's Submersion of Japan, 1973, and Jun Fukuda's Espai, 1974. We'll see him next in Gamera vs. Gauss, 1967. To the right of Inami is a white-haired actor named Osamu Mariyama, who appeared in over 120 films at Daiei including Kenji Mizuguchi's Princess Yang Kuei Fei, 1955. In Gamera, he played the director of the Atomic Research Center. Behind him, in a white lab coat, is Tomu Nakata, another character actor who appeared in over a hundred films, including the Woman Gambler series. Nakata plays Professor Amano's assistant and was Toshio's uncle in the first Gamera. We'll see both of them again in Gamera vs. Gauss, 1967. <laughs> The film's narrator is Genzo Wakayama, born in Hokkaido on September 27, 1932, who is perhaps the most famous voice in Japan. While announcing and hosting numerous radio shows throughout his 50-year career, he's also dubbed scores of films and television series. As the voice of Sean Connery in the Bond films, he became so associated with Connery that he's dubbed him as recently as The Rock in 1996. Wakayama also dubbed Christopher Plummer in The Sound of Music 1965 and a host of Hollywood stars including Lee Marvin, Gene Barry, Raymond Burr, George Kennedy, Peter Graves, and even Clayton Moore. He also provided the narration for The Outer Limits, Star Trek, and Battlestar Galactica and was the voice of Vic Morrow in Kinji Fukasaku's Message from Space 1978. Today, Wakayama is still active in radio announcing and commercials. We'll hear him next as the voice of the boss Viren in Gamera vs. Virus 1968. Now, I always thought that this was a really cool shot when I was a kid. It's a great optical effect by Yuzo Kaneko. Yeah, isn't it cool? Yeah, while some Western critics over the years have lambasted the Japanese fantasy film for its visual effects, usually only seeing them on television and pan and scan versions, but to my eyes, the optical effects have always been outstanding. Oh, I've really liked them too, yeah. And from Baragon's Ray to King Ghidorah's Lightning Bolts, they have always been far more dynamic to me than similar effects in American films. Sure, absolutely. The aforementioned veteran Bontaro Miyake, who played the SDF commander, also appeared in Keisuke Kinoshita's Carmen Comes Home, 1951, Mikio Naruse's Late Chrysanthemums, 1953, Kenji Mizuguchi's Princess Yang Kuei Fei, 1955, Kenji Misumi's Satan's Sword, 1960, and Buddha, 1961. Yasuzo Masumura's Black Test Car, 1962, Junya Sato's Organized Crime, 1967, Yasuharu Hasebe's Bloody Territories, 1969, Richard Fleischer's Tora Tora Tora, 1970, and Atsushi Mihori's Criminal Woman, Killing Melody, 1973. In Koji Shima's Warning from Space, 1956, he played the role of Dr. Komura. He also guest starred in episode 36 of the Toei superhero series Kamen Rider V3, 1973. Now, with the departure of Yonisaburo Sakiji from Dae, 
Taking on the difficult chore of visual effects director was both an opportunity and a challenge for Noriaki Yuasa. Since his father was acquainted with Japan's visual effects giant Eiji Tsuburaya, Yuasa was able to call on the master of monsters to help. At the time, Tsuburaya was riding high on the initial success of his hit television series Ultra Q and was busy preparing to begin shooting his next, Ultraman. This was in addition to his work at Toho, including Shiro Moritani's Zero Fighter and Ishiro Honda's The War of the Gargantuas. Agreeing to help Yuasa, Tsuburaya allowed the young director to tap the resources he had pulled at his own company, Tsuburaya Productions, for advice and know-how. Yuasa felt that one of the most frustrating aspects of producing the first Gamera was keeping someone inside the claustrophobic, suffocating, and heavy monster suits. They almost went through one man per day because they were untrained and couldn't take it. That's where Haruo Nakajima, the man who played Godzilla, comes in. A veteran monster suit actor since 1954 and one of Tsuburaya's most valuable players, Nakajima had helped to train other actors in the rigors of playing these monsters. In early 1966, he was prepping a new generation of men in suits for the upcoming Ultraman series, which would commence production in March. This new generation of suit actors would include Teruo Aragaki, Kunio Suzuki, Takashi Sato, Umenosuke Izumi, Harukichi Nakamura, Yukihiro Seino, Yuji Fujita, Fumio Ikea, Akira Minami, Hiroshi Iwamoto, Katsuaki Kawada, and Eiichi Matsushima. That's a lot of guys, and they played a lot of monsters. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Positioned as the main monster suit actor for Ultraman, Teru Aragaki was sent over to Yuasa at Dae to take on the role of Gamera. Now, while documentation is yet to surface naming the actor who essayed Baragon, using the process of elimination, I, I'm going to have to assume that it was uh, Umenosuke Izumi. Now, as Aragaki's second, Izumi would go on to take over his Gamera, starting with Gamera vs. Gilan in 1969. So one would assume that Yuasa would have just bumped up the actor playing the antagonist, since they already had a working relationship. And if we're able to solve this mystery, we'll report it right here in one of our following commentaries. Lord knows we're looking. Because we have nothing else better to do. <laughs> After another long absence, Gamera returns to the film for the final duel by finally thawing out from Baragon's deep freeze. An all-new Gamera suit, distinguished by its malevolent eyes, was built for this film by Masao and Hiroshi Yagi of Equus Productions, who created the various incarnations and suits for Gamera in the first film, and throughout the series. For many fans, this is also considered one of their favorite suits, and it definitely is mine. Yeah, it's, I have to say that I agree with that, and uh, it is one of the coolest Gamera suits. Absolutely. The JSDF scout on the far left is the gaunt Keiichiro Yamane, who played the geothermal power plant director in Gamera. He can also be seen in Kon Ichikawa's The Money Dance, 1963, and Yasuzo Masamura's Red Angel and Nakano Spy School, both in 1966. He returns as a merchant marine in Gamera vs. Gauss, 1967, and as an alien in Gamera vs. Virus, 1968. New from Dae! It's the Monster City Defroster! But wait, there's more! It turns all your electricity on! Operators are standing by. All major credit cards accepted. <laughs> that was ridiculous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You've been a great audience. We'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> well, noted earlier, Baragon was created by Yurio Sake Takayama, but he was assisted by Keizu Murase of Eki's Productions. Another ex-member of Toho's prosthetics department, Murase's first solo effort was the monster suit for Ishiro Honda's Varan, 1958. He also helped to create the monster suits for Kim Ki-duk's Yongari, Monster from the Deep, 1967, and Kinji Fukusaku's The Green Slime in 1968. Murase would also go on to form his own company, 20. Noriaki Yuasa began principal photography for the visual effects on Gamera vs. Baragon on January 22, 1966, starting with Gamera's attack on Kurobe Dam. Production wrapped on April 3, 1966, with the final confrontation at Lake Biwa for a total of 72 days. 12 days longer than on the first Gamera. Meanwhile, principal photography for director Shigeo Tanaka scenes commenced on February 20th, 1966, with production wrapping 92 days later on April 5th, 1966, 37 days longer than Gamera's production, and a generous schedule by any standard at the time. The film opened in theaters only two weeks later on April 17th, 1966. Leaping lizards! Oh, friggin' say. <laughs> Finally, we get down to the real nitty gritty as Gamera returns to dispatch Baragon. For these shots of Baragon leaping at the colossal Colonian, the task of wire operation fell into the hands of practical effects engineer Haruo Sekia. Quote, 
There were so many wires to deal with in regards to Barragon. When Gamera threw him across Lake Biwa, that alone required over 20 wires. I always had to be extremely conscious whether the wires would be visible on screen or not, and I even had to be concerned with such details as the position and movement of Barragon's legs when he leapt into the air. He was one of the most difficult monsters to work with. Not to mention that the materials made to use Barragon would quickly absorb water, and he became so heavy. Oh, how heavy those things got in the water. End quote. Now, this is a fantastic shot coming up here with the camera panning up and then going back down. Yeah, it's a monster POV, something that Yuasa came up with that you don't see in these films. Right. Ow! Oh, that's, that's gotta the... hurt. There goes Piwako Bridge. Biwako, or Lake Biwa, is the largest freshwater lake in Japan, about 259 square miles, located in Shiga Prefecture, not too far away from Kyoto. It is home to many popular beaches along the southwestern shore. Its main outlet is the Seto River, which provides drinking water for about 15 million people in the Kyoto and Otsu regions of Japan. It is one of the world's top 20 oldest lakes, and because of this fact has an incredibly diverse ecosystem, including roughly 60 species that are found nowhere else on Earth. But excuse me, Professor, are there any monsters there? <laughs> so, August, I don't know about you, but I really like uh, Gamera vs. Baragon. It's probably one of my more favorites in the series. Um, I think I like the serious attitude that we have here. Uh, the special effects are amazing, but uh, I also am very fond of uh, some of the later films as well, of course. Uh, love Gauss, and I'm actually looking forward to Gilan as well. Yeah, I really do like all of the films uh, kind of equally, and uh, having to sit through this movie a bunch of times and do this audio commentary. <laughs> Several uh, hundred times. The movie that never ends. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a long one. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to really, like, uh, cherish the uh, later movies a little more just because uh, they're, they're, they move a lot faster and they're uh, just psychotic. Right. You know? And we'll be looking forward to taking you through those. And here we go, more spurting purple blood. And that's what makes these films cool. Now, these scenes of Baragon's demise were planned to be shot on the last day of production, April 2nd, 1966, but they ran into a bit of a problem. While Haruo Sekiya mentioned that the Baragon suit absorbed water and thus made it extremely heavy, the damn thing wouldn't sink. No matter how much they weighed the suit down, Baragon kept floating. This mishap delayed production for a full day. The next day, Ryo Sakatakiyama decided that the best way to sink the suit was to cut off a limb or two, something that would be underwater and not visible to the audience. Taking up the scissors himself, Takayama first cut off the tail. This was not enough. Then went the back legs. That still wasn't enough. Then he cut off the lower section. Not enough. Baragon would not sink. Finally, Takayama cut away everything but the head. And Yuasa and his crew were able to be successful in getting the shot in the can and wrapping production. Now here you can see Takayama's craftsmanship with the uh, models here underwater. Uh, the kind of shot that didn't show up too often in Toho films, but uh, quite a bit in the Gamera series. And here, finally, Baragon is held down underwater long enough for it to die. And here we see Baragon expelling his rainbow for the very final time, uh, something Takahashi wrote into the screenplay, and uh, something he would use again for the next film, Gamera vs. Gauss, when uh, Gauss's laser beam uh, is being emitted from the volcano. Oh, you just spoiled the next movie for everybody. Oh, sorry, everybody. Despite his fears, which might have become reality, Kojiro Hongo's career did not end with Gamera vs. Baragon. He would appear in two more Gameras, as well as starring in three more Daiei fantasy films. Kenji Masumi's Wrath of Daimajin, 1966, Satsuo Yamamoto's Bride from Hades, 1968, Kimiyoshi Yasuda and Yoshioki Kuroda's Along with Ghosts, 1969. He also co-starred with Kyoko Unami in Woman Gambler in 1967. Aside from numerous films, he also starred in the long-running Toei TV detective drama Special Investigation Frontline from 1977 to 1987. He also co-starred with Sonny Chiba in Kazuhiko Yamaguchi's Karate for Life 1977 and starred in Takamitsu Sato's Hell Cop 1990. He was cast in two of Seichi Shirai's Tokyo Mafia films from 1995 and was top billed in Takashi Miike's Family 2001. His last screen credit seems to be Shigeru Ishihara's The Road to Be Boss, Part 1 and 2, 2003. In 2004, he suffered a stroke and was unconscious for a time, but has since made a miraculous recovery. We'll see him next on the next Gamera film, 1967's Gamera vs. Gauss. Now this final scene where Keisuke tells Karin that now he has nothing was a little different in the original screenplay. 
In response, Karn says, And so are your dreams for your own air service too, right? This line could have come off as adding insult to injury, and is that why it was dropped from the final film? Maybe we'll never know. But at least they found true love. They sure did, and now it looks like they're going to be spending the rest of their days in New Guinea. Yeah. Dodging scorpions and uh, avoiding quicksand pits. <laughs> and interestingly, you know, New Guinea has not really been completely explored, so maybe somewhere there is a Valley of the Rainbow and there could be a Baragon lurking out there. But will we have a Gamera to protect us? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining us for this audio commentary, and I'd like to thank Jason for joining me and helping put together all the work on this. It was pretty exhaustive. <laughs> it sure was very exhaustive, but it was fun. Uh, there's not much written on these films, but it was fun to look up. Yeah, especially when you have to do all the research in Japanese. It's... <laughs> yeah, oh, but it can be done, folks. It can. And so thanks again. Uh, and Gamera is gone for now, but he'll be back in Gamera versus Gauss.